Last fall, I took a solo camping trip into the Ozarks. I've always found peace in the solitude of nature, the calmness of trees, and the serenity of the night sky. The mountains were a place I thought would be a haven from the hustle of daily life. Little did I know, I was stepping into a realm where the border between the living and the dead was unsettlingly thin. I set up camp in a small clearing surrounded by the dense forest a good distance from any trails. The first day passed without incident, filled with hiking and taking photographs of the breathtaking scenery. As the sun set, I settled in for the night, the fire casting long shadows between the trees. That's when I first noticed the stillness. The woods are never silent. There's always the rustle of small animals, the chirping of crickets, the whisper of the wind. But that night, there was nothing, like the forest was holding its breath. It started with a mist, creeping in from the fringes of the woods, unnatural and thick, swallowing up the light from my fire until the flames flickered feebly in the fog. Then the figures appeared. They were faint, barely more than less dense areas within the mist, human-shaped but indistinct. They moved around the periphery of my camp, shifting in and out of focus, Frozen in place, I could only watch as more figures emerged, forming a spectral audience around me. None made a sound, and none approached the firelight's edge. They simply watched. It felt like a standoff between the living and the dead, the minutes stretching into an eternity as the apparitions surrounded me. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, with a gust of wind, they were gone. The mist receded, the natural sounds of the forest returned, and I was alone once more. The fire had burnt down to embers during the encounter, giving me a stark reminder of how much time had passed. I was hesitant to sleep, fearing they would return if I let my guard down. Morning couldn't come fast enough. Once the sun rose, I packed up my camp faster than ever before, the memory of the ghostly figures pressing me to hurry. I practically ran out of the woods, and it wasn't until I reached my car that I finally felt safe enough to catch my breath. After I had gotten home, a local historian enlightened me. The area where I had camped was near a historic trail that many early settlers used to travel west. Numerous people perished on that journey, succumbing to the hardships of the wilderness. They were buried hastily, their graves unmarked and forgotten scattered throughout the forest. My encounter with the phantoms of the Ozarks has stayed with me. The images of those ghostly figures, appearing within the mist and the oppressive sensation of being surrounded, still invade my dreams. The mountains, with their sprawling forests, towering peaks, and hidden graves, hold many secrets, and some, it seems, occasionally walk back into the light to be seen. In Eureka Springs, hidden by overgrowth and surrounded by a heavy silence, sits the skeleton of an old asylum. As an avid explorer of abandoned places, I couldn't resist the allure of its crumbling walls and the secrets they held. I had heard the local tales of strange happenings, ghostly sightings, and an oppressive aura of despair that clung to the place. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, I found myself drawn there on a cool autumn afternoon, camera in hand. The asylum was a haunting sight, with nature clawing back every inch of the grounds. Inside, it was much the same. Time had peeled the paint from the walls and debris littered the hallways. Each step I took kicked up years of dust and the only sound was the distant caw of crows outside. As I explored, I entered what looked to have been a patient's room, relatively intact compared to others. And there, among the decay, 
I found a diary, its pages yellowed with age, the leather cover worn. Compelled by curiosity, I perched on a broken chair and began to read, the silence of the asylum pressing in around me. The diary belonged to a woman who had been a patient there. Her entries started as mundane, detailing her confusion, her life within the asylum walls, and her growing despair. But as the pages turned, her writings took on a frantic tone. She began to speak of a presence, a malevolent spirit she called the Shadow Man. She wrote of how the Shadow Man whispered cruel things, how he reveled in the anguish of the patients, and how he seemed to feed off the darkness that enveloped their lives. Her descriptions grew more vivid with each encounter, the chill of his touch, the way the shadows seemed to twist into sinister shapes in his presence, the way darkness seemed to deepen, consuming the light around him. One entry stood out, a harrowing account of a night the shadow man had come to her. She had been lying in bed, awake, the moon offering meager light through the barred window. Her room had grown inexplicably cold, and then she'd felt it, a hand, icy and forceful, gripping her leg, pulling her. She had tried to scream, but no sound escaped. And then she'd seen him in the corner, a darker void in the darkness, watching, whispering words she couldn't quite hear, but felt like needles in her mind. I sat, frozen, her words painting a terrifying image that lingered behind my eyelids. The room felt colder, the shadows within stretching as the sun dipped lower outside. That's when I heard it, a whisper, so soft it could have been my imagination, yet it prickled the hair on the back of my neck. Rattled, I shoved the diary into my bag, suddenly eager to escape the oppressive atmosphere of the room, to get away from the shadows that seemed just a bit too animate. I stumbled from the room, my footsteps quickening as I navigated the debris-strewn corridors, the building seeming to warp around me into a menacing labyrinth. As I emerged into the waning sunlight, I could have sworn I heard a low laugh resonating from the bowels of the asylum, a sound devoid of any humor, only promising darkness. I didn't look back, not until I was well away from the building and the suffocating aura it exuded. I've kept the diary, a chilling memento of that day. Sometimes, when the night is quiet, and I dare to revisit its pages, I swear the temperature in my room drops several degrees and the shadows twitch just slightly. The whispers of the past, it seems, don't always like to be left behind. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me, a voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation, impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, 
swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone, in an ancient well, chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air, I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are, unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments, forever raising questions that dare not be answered. It happened so quickly. One moment she was beside me, laughing as we chased a butterfly. The next, she was gone. I called out her name, my voice swallowed by the thickness of the forest. Hours turned into days, days into weeks. The search parties dwindled, hope waned, and the forest became a forbidden zone, a place of loss and unspeakable grief. Life moved on, but the wound remained fresh. My family was a broken puzzle with a missing piece. Then, ten years later, Emily returned. I was in the kitchen when I heard the door creak open. My heart sank, expecting to see another hollow-eyed stranger asking about the girl who disappeared. Instead, there she was, standing on the threshold, unchanged, as if a decade had been but a moment. Emily? She nodded. I'm back, Alex. Her voice was the same, a time capsule preserved from our childhood. My parents, stunned into silence at first, broke down in tears and laughter, embracing her as if she were a mirage that might vanish at any moment. Questions erupted like fireworks. Where was she? How did she survive? And most hauntingly, why hadn't she aged a day? I was in the forest, she said softly, but not our forest. It was different, timeless. I tried to find my way back, but couldn't. And then, suddenly, I was here. She spoke of a realm where trees whispered secrets and streams flowed with an ethereal glow, a world almost magical, but also capricious, indifferent to human notions of time and age. Yet she couldn't explain how she had returned only that the forest had let her go. Authorities were baffled. 
doctors examined her, finding not a single mark of a decade-long ordeal. Friends and relatives, once jubilant, grew quiet, unnerved by her unchanging presence. But to me, she was still Emily, the sister I had lost and miraculously regained. We returned to the forest, hand in hand, stepping over roots and rocks as we had as children. She led me to the spot where she had vanished, an unremarkable clearing marked only by a lone, gnarled tree. Here, she said, this is where it happened. I looked around, half expecting the air to shimmer or the ground to give way, revealing the magical realm she had described. But the forest remained just a forest, beautiful but silent. Are you okay? I asked, my voice tinged with concern and a hint of sorrow. How do you rebuild a decade of lost time? She smiled, that same radiant smile that had vanished and then reappeared, unchanged. I am Alex. It's not about the time we lost, but the moments we still have. And so we walked back, each footfall a step toward an uncertain but hopeful future. Emily was back, a walking mystery, a timeless child in a world bound by clocks and calendars. Yet, as we left the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that another realm lay just beyond the veil of leaves and shadows, waiting for the next unwary traveler to stray too far from the beaten path. But for now, the forest was once again our playground, a little less mysterious perhaps, but no less wondrous. Nestled within the heart of Boston, Beacon Hill is renowned for its cobblestone streets, federal-style row houses, and gaslit lamps. I had recently moved into a quaint brownstone there, relishing the historical ambiance the neighborhood offered. The apartment was cozy, its walls echoing stories from the past. The previous owner had left behind an antique gramophone, a relic from a bygone era. I found it charming, and it quickly became the centerpiece of my living room. One evening, after a particularly tiring day, I was jolted awake by a soft melody playing from the gramophone. Confused, since I hadn't acquired any records for it yet, I approached the device. The turntable spun, but there was no record. The music was hauntingly beautiful, an old ballad of love and loss. As the tune played, a sudden drop in temperature enveloped the room. My breath became visible, forming small puffs of mist. And then, in the dim light of the gas lamp, I saw her. A translucent figure, dressed in a flowing gown from the 1800s, waltzing alone, her movements graceful and full of longing. Her eyes, deep pools of sadness, seemed to be searching for someone. Not wanting to disturb her, I watched in silent awe. As the final notes of the melody faded, she extended her hand as if beckoning a partner to join her. But alas, no one came. With a forlorn sigh, she vanished, leaving the room in silence. The following day, eager to understand what I had just witnessed, I visited the local library. Delving into the history of my residence, I uncovered a tragic love story from the 19th century. Eleanor, a talented violinist, lived in my very apartment. She was betrothed to a sailor, Thomas, who had promised to return to her after his final voyage. To celebrate their upcoming nuptials, Eleanor had composed a ballad, which she played on her gramophone each night, awaiting Thomas's return. However, he never did. Heartbroken, Eleanor passed away from what folks termed a broken heart. Now it seems her spirit remains tethered to the brownstone of Beacon Hill, forever waiting for her lover's return, seeking solace in the melody of their unfinished love story. Some nights, when the wind howls and the gas lamps flicker, I play the gramophone, filling the room with music, 
hoping to give Eleanor a few moments of peace and a dance with the memories of her lost love. I've always enjoyed exploring the remote wooded hills around my hometown. There's something magical about being alone among the birds and trees. One Saturday, I decided to hike farther than usual, bringing along a map and a compass. After a few hours, I came to a rocky bluff. In the valley below sat a small, decrepit house, hidden in a hollow between the hills. Curious, I scrambled down for a closer look. The place seemed long abandoned. I circled the sagging porch, peering in the dusty windows. Inside was a simple one-room home, modestly furnished. Books and faded newspapers were scattered across the floor, as if the owner had left in a hurry. A noise behind made me spin around. At the edge of the tree stood a woman, silently watching me. Her old-fashioned dress was filthy and torn, her gray hair in a tangled mess. Surprised, I asked if she lived here. She only stared, expressionless. Uneasy, I turned to leave. Glancing back, I saw her stepping silently into the brush. I hurried up the bluff, confused by the strange encounter. At home, I searched local historical records, finding no indication anyone had lived in that remote hollow for decades. The mysterious woman had seemed like a ghost haunting the abandoned house. Intrigued, I decided to return. The next Saturday, I hiked back to the hollow, entering the house to explore further. Nothing had changed from my first visit. Curiously, there was no electricity or plumbing. It was like stepping back in time. I searched for some clue as to who had lived here, finding only a tarnished silver pocket watch engraved with the initials JB. Just then, movement outside caught my eye. The same elderly woman stood in the yard, staring vacantly. I approached her slowly, asking again who she was. Up close, her eyes were clouded, as if blinded or catatonic. She mumbled incoherently, clutching her tattered dress. I noticed her bare feet were caked in mud and leaves. Growing uneasy, I left her there, swaying, and walked back home. I had to learn who she was and why she inhabited this forgotten place. Over the following week, I scoured archives, finally discovering J.B., Jacob Benton, a hermit who had lived in that hollow from 1920 until his death in the 1960s. Could this be his ghost somehow still lingering? Against my better judgment, I returned once more, descending the bluff to confront the mystery. But when I entered the empty house, something felt wrong. There was an earthy, animal smell, trails of dirt scattered across the floor. In Jacob's bedroom, the closet door now hung open. Inside, makeshift bedding lay on the floor, leaves and twigs scattered about. My pulse quickened. Someone had been sleeping here. Back outside, the yard was empty, the woman nowhere to be seen. Uneasy, I left to hike home. Had she been real at all? I now feared returning to that house, yet felt compelled to unravel its secrets. But my curiosity will remain unfulfilled. The next weekend, I searched the hollow in vain. The house and the woman had vanished without a trace, leaving only unanswered questions. Working as a night security guard at a museum in Pine Bluff, I believed I had one of the easiest jobs just meandering through silent exhibits, occasionally checking doors and watching monitors. However, 
One night turned the monotony into absolute terror, permanently etching itself into my memory. It was a routine shift, the museum eerily quiet, the only sounds my footsteps and the distant hum of the air conditioning. I was making my rounds, walking through a new exhibit on ancient artifacts, items belonging to a civilization renowned for their potent connection to the spiritual realm. I remember stopping to study a ceremonial mask, its features contorted into an eternal scream, supposedly used in rituals to ward off malevolent spirits. That's when I heard the first whisper. Turning around, I found nothing but the stillness of the exhibit. Chalking it up to my imagination, I continued on. However, the whispers grew, a chorus of unintelligible murmurs bouncing off the walls. Heart racing, I ventured deeper into the exhibit, where a set of ceremonial daggers were displayed. And that's when I saw it, one of the daggers, floating in midair, as if held by invisible hands. And that's when I saw it, one of the daggers, floating in midair, as if held by invisible hands. Before I could process the scene, it clattered to the floor. The whispers morphed into a cacophony of angry voices. Panic took over, and I ran towards the main hall, but stopped dead in my tracks. The artifacts were animating. Statues were turning their heads to watch me, painted eyes following my every move, and pottery shards assembling, suspended in the air, forming incomplete, hovering figures. The air grew dense, and a deep, guttural growl filled the space. It was coming from the mask I had admired earlier. Except now, it wasn't just a carving. The mask was alive, the mouth moving, the sound resonating through the bones of the building. It spoke in a language I couldn't understand, but the message was clear, anger, and a warning. In sheer terror, I bolted, not looking back, my breaths ragged and heart feeling like it was about to burst. I didn't slow down until I was in the safety of the security office, slamming the door shut and locking it. Through the monitors, I watched the artifacts slowly return to their inanimate state, the shadows receding as though nothing had occurred. I quit the job immediately after that night. The museum conducted multiple investigations, checking the footage, which inexplicably showed nothing but me running in panic through empty, silent rooms. They concluded it was a stress-induced episode, but I know what I witnessed. That night at the museum in Pine Bluff tore down the rational world around me, introducing me to a realm where ancient spirits stirred to life within their treasured artifacts. The experience left me with nightmares that follow me to this day, reminding me that some things especially those tied with spiritual reverence from their past, carry with them an essence that refuses to be caged, even in death. I'm not someone who believes in monsters or the supernatural, but after what I saw at my uncle's remote cabin, I don't know what to believe. It started as a normal visit to his cabin in the middle of the woods. I was bored one sunny afternoon and decided to explore the surrounding forest. I wandered pretty far from the cabin into the dense trees. Eventually, I stumbled onto a small shed tucked way back in the tree line. Scrawled on the wooden door in what looked like dried blood, were strange symbols and writings I didn't recognize. A big padlock was hanging on the door, but it was unlocked. Against my better judgment, curiosity got the best of me. I slowly opened the creaky door and went inside. It was pitch black and smelled like mold, much bigger inside than it looked from the outside. I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. That's when I saw it. Crouched in the corner was this pale, naked creature with sunken black eyes and rows of jagged, sharp teeth. It was hairless and unnaturally skinny, with long, spindly limbs. It looked right at me, eyes shining with some sort of awareness that didn't seem natural or human. 
I was frozen in terror and disgust. It made this weird scuttling movement, dragging itself sideways along the wall like a crab, never taking its eyes off me. That snapped me out of it. I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I slammed the door shut and started running blindly into the woods. Behind me I could hear it shrieking, this ear-piercing, inhuman scream. It started clawing at the walls and throwing itself against the door, trying to get to me. The sounds followed me as I ran. I didn't stop sprinting until I got back to the cabin. I locked all the doors and windows, shaking uncontrollably. What I had seen was real, and clearly dangerous. It was evil, some twisted, unnatural thing that should not exist. First thing the next morning, I packed up and left, knowing I would never return. I never told my uncle what I saw. I have nightmares about its empty black eyes staring hungrily at me. It knew I had discovered it. Whatever it was, it did not want to be found. I wish I'd never opened that shed or seen the creature inside. It's an image I'll never get out of my head. Some things are better left alone, hidden away from humanity. There are horrors people aren't meant to know or understand. That pale, skinny thing in the shed was one of them. No good can come from such unnatural things lurking in the shadows. I learned that the hard way. I was never a fan of long-haul flights, hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean. An island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch or... The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. 
But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat, eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. There were no signs of human life, no structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant, those questions hovered in the thick, humid air, unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar, the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did. A couple of years ago, I took a trip to Helena West Helena, drawn by the historical allure and the chilling stories that surrounded the old plantations there. One plantation in particular caught my interest, infamous for its hauntings attributed to the dark and tragic past it harbored. Visitors and paranormal investigators had reported strange occurrences, from inexplicable cold spots and haunting cries to ghostly sightings of former slaves. I perhaps naively, wanted to experience it for myself. I arranged for a visit and was guided through the grand, antiquated structure and its grounds. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a palpable shift in the atmosphere could be felt. What was once merely historical and serene became foreboding, the weight of past atrocities hanging heavy in the air. It was in the decrepit quarters, some distance from the main house, where cotton workers once lived and suffered, that I felt it. A sudden, piercing cold that burrowed into my very bones. The air grew dense, pressing in around me, and I struggled to catch my breath. The guide, noticing my discomfort, suggested we head back, attributing my unease to the emotionally charged environment. But I knew it was more than that. As we turned to leave, I saw her, an apparition in tattered clothing, her eyes hollow and empty of life, but filled with an unspeakable pain and anger. She seemed to look right through me, and in that gaze, I felt every ounce of suffering she had endured. She moved, her form a spectral blur, and stopped us in our tracks. The temperature around us plummeted further, and I could see my breath form fog before me. The guide was petrified, unable to utter a sound, his eyes wide with terror. The spirit spoke then, her voice a whisper that clawed its way through the cold, heavy with sorrow and rage. 
She spoke of injustices, of the cruelty she and others had endured, of the life that was ripped away from her. She demanded retribution, her figure growing brighter and more solid as her anger flowed, her pain a raw force in the confined space. And then, with words that resonated in the very core of my being, she claimed, justice. I seek justice. As quickly as she had appeared, she dissipated into a mist that retreated into the walls of the quarters, leaving a hollow silence in her wake. The guide and I, freed from our paralysis, hurried back to the main area without looking back. Upon returning, the guide, pale as a ghost himself, explained that sightings were common, but an encounter like that was rare. He believed that the spirits of those who suffered there were restless, seeking closure and justice that they never received in life. That encounter shook me to my core. The look in the spirit's eyes, the pain and the longing for justice, was something that haunted me long after. It was a stark reminder of the dark chapters of our history, of the voices silenced and forgotten, and the echoes of that pain that linger in places stained with such suffering. The experience etched into my understanding an intimate portrait of sorrow that history books could never convey, making me a vessel for their plea for remembrance and justice. But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack, a second bark, echoing Stella's but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled, a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. 
As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark. But the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night, and our hikes returned to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, size seven. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence. The trees seemed to loom a little taller their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint. A right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rear view mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. 
the shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question, a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest. An unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running, each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind, or perhaps in farewell. We never returned to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots lined up neatly by the door. And I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return, and wondering what might happen if we do. Ever walk into a room and suddenly feel a chill, like you've stepped into an invisible cold patch? That started happening in my house, specifically in the hallway that leads to the bathroom. I'd be walking, maybe humming a tune, and then I'd hit that spot. The air would turn icy, so cold that it would make the hairs on my arms stand up. The first couple of times, I just brushed it off. Old house, drafty corridors. It made sense, right? But it kept happening. Always the same spot. Always the same bone-chilling cold. It didn't matter if it was in the middle of summer. That spot stayed frozen. Friends noticed it too when they came over. Dude, do you feel that? They'd say, shivering as they passed through the hallway. I couldn't ignore it anymore. One night, around 2 a.m., I'm jolted awake. Groggy, thirsty, I head to the kitchen for a glass of water. As I'm crossing that spot in the hallway, the cold hits me, but this time, it's different. It feels like someone's watching me, and not just watching, staring. The air feels heavy, like I'm wading through a pool of icy water. I quicken my pace, get to the kitchen, and gulp down a glass of water like it's a lifeline. For some reason, I decide I have to know. So I go back to the hallway, right to that spot, and I just stand there. It's stupid, I know, but I had to. The chill wraps around me, tighter and tighter, and I swear I hear something, like a faint whisper, too low to make out the words, but clear enough to know that it's a voice. I bolt, I practically sprint back to my bedroom and slam the door shut. My heart's racing, my mind's reeling, but then after a few minutes, the chill starts to fade. The room warms up and that weight, that heavy air lifts and I'm alone again, truly alone. The next day, I bring in a local historian. Bit of a stretch, but I had to dig deeper. She walks through the house, stops at the spot, and frowns. Turns out, a hundred years ago, this was the home of a doctor. And that spot in the hallway? Well, that's where he would examine his patients, some of whom didn't make it. I still feel the cold, but it doesn't really scare me anymore. Maybe it's a draft, 
but maybe it's something else. A remnant from a different time. Either way, I've learned to give that spot the space it seems to demand. It's a part of the house, a part of its history, a cold patch that holds on to something that most of us will probably never understand. Driving late at night used to be my peace, a kind of therapy that required only gas money and an endless stretch of asphalt. The hum of the engine, the crisp air pouring in through the slightly open window. It was bliss, until it wasn't. I had veered off the main highway onto some forgotten road, meandering through open farmland. Cornfields waved eerily in the night wind, forming dark walls on either side of me. No houses, no streetlights, just the glow of my headlights and the hypnotic emptiness of the road. Then the car choked, engine sputtering, dashboard lights flickering like dying stars. My foot jabbed at the gas pedal, but it was useless. Momentum carried me another hundred feet before the car stalled completely. The dashboard went dark, and I was left with the high beams of my headlights casting feeble rays into the abyss ahead. I cursed, slamming my hands on the steering wheel. Come on, not now. Phone out. No signal. Perfect. Glancing at the cornfields, I fought the instinctive dread curling into my stomach. I should have stayed on the highway. Just when I thought it couldn't get worse, a light flooded the car. Bright, blinding, and entirely unnatural. It didn't radiate from a single point, but seemed to envelop everything, turning night into a glaring, strange day. I shielded my eyes, squinting to make sense of what was happening. Then, as quickly as it appeared, the light vanished. I blinked, trying to adjust to the sudden darkness. My car roared back to life, dashboard lights, engine, everything, as if nothing had happened. I checked my phone. It had a full signal, the clock displaying a time two hours later than the last moment I remembered. With a trembling hand, I shifted into drive, eager to leave this damned road. The car moved, but something in the rearview mirror caught my eye. Among the rows of corn, something tall and slender moved, a distorted figure silhouetted against the dark receding into the depths of the field. My foot slammed onto the accelerator, rocketing me away from whatever had just occurred. The rest of the ride home was a blur, my mind racing faster than the car's engine. I finally pulled into my driveway, safe under the familiar glow of my porch light. Yet, as I turned off the engine, I glanced at the passenger seat. There, lying next to me, was a stalk of corn freshly pulled from the ground, dirt still clinging to its roots. And etched into my dashboard, now burned into it, were unfamiliar symbols, cryptic and intricate, the meaning of which I couldn't fathom. I still drive, but never late at night, and never off the main highway. Whatever happened on that road, whatever that blinding light was, Whatever the figure in the cornfield meant, I don't want answers. Some things are better left unknown. But sometimes when I start my car, the dashboard lights flicker, and I find unfamiliar roads on my GPS, routes I never took but feel oddly compelled to follow. And though I always resist, the urge gets stronger each time, as if something out there isn't done with me yet. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything, 
The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly. But there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables. Nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was. But after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. But it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's Belt, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting, not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive, they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night. Each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breath shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, 
as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. It first appeared 10 miles in, just beyond a bend in the trail where the pine trees grew thick enough to turn daylight into dusk. A small wooden totem figure, weathered but intricately carved, a fusion of animal shapes and human faces, staked into the ground like a miniature sentry. I figured it was a trail marker or a backpacker's forgotten memento, so I took a photo and moved on. Another five miles later, there it was again. Same totem same details, same inscrutable expression on its carved face. I picked it up, half expecting it to be the same one I'd seen earlier, as if I'd somehow looped back on myself. But my GPS showed a straight trajectory, and I knew the trail well enough to rule out accidental backtracking. An odd coincidence, surely. I left it where I found it, suppressing the nagging feeling that the forest had grown quieter, as if holding its breath. The third time left no room for coincidences. 17 miles into the hike, after crossing a stream that wasn't even on the map, the totem reappeared. The forest canopy seemed darker than before, the air thick with a silence that drowned even the rustling leaves. I looked over my shoulder, half expecting to catch someone trailing me, but the path behind was empty, holding on to its secrets like a miser clutching gold. I pocketed the totem this time, its wooden surface cool to the touch. It weighed more than its size suggested, like it carried a gravity all its own. It was just wood and carving, I told myself. The work of an artist messing with hikers, or maybe a series of similar markers from a local tribe. And yet, as I stowed it away, I couldn't shake the sense that I'd just accepted a challenge, or maybe a dare. With the totem in my backpack, the trail seemed to shift in subtle ways. The bird song turned discordant. The roots and rocks seemed to rearrange themselves underfoot. I'd been on this trail half a dozen times, but the familiarity had worn thin, leaving me to navigate an uncanny version of a place I thought I knew. My watch beeped, the end of another mile, but when I looked down, the totem was there again. Right on the trail, its carved eyes aimed straight at me. The impossibility of the situation stabbed at my rational mind. I unzipped my bag. The earlier totem was still there, so now there were two, identical down to the minutest detail. A thought invaded my mind like a whispered suggestion. Leave the trail, step into the woods, go where the path leads you. I fought against it, but the thought persisted, echoing louder with each step as if the forest itself was urging me to stray. I stopped, taking deep breaths to center myself. I was the intruder here, a transient trespasser in a world that danced to ancient rhythms. 
my eyes scanned the darkened woods around me, half expecting them to part and reveal. What? An answer? A revelation? Finally, I placed both totems side by side on a bed of pine needles, aligning them to face the depths of the forest, and backed away. An air of finality settled, like an unspoken agreement reached. The moment stretched, then snapped. I felt the forest exhale, its breath rustling through the leaves like a sigh of relief. I retreated, leaving the totems to their inscrutable vigil. The trail returned to its familiar state as I made my way back, each mile erasing the sense of dislocation, each step reaffirming the natural order. But the totems remained, at least in my thoughts. Were they guardians or omens? A test or a message? The forest keeps its secrets well, divulging them only to those willing to stray from the path. Yet, even now, the carved faces haunt my dreams, silent, expectant, and always, always watching. It was mid-October when I settled into an old-style, somewhat run-down house in Little Rock. The price was a steal, and the neighborhood was drenched in the kind of history that made every building intriguing. The house itself was a classic, probably around a century old, with creaky wooden floors, a grand staircase, and, most notably, a spacious attic with a peculiar, tiny door. The first few days went by uneventfully as I busied myself with unpacking and cleaning. However, about a week after moving in, the oddities began. I was brushing my teeth one night when I heard a soft, indistinct murmur. I paused, listening. It sounded like whispers, but I was alone, and it was late at night. The rational side of me attributed it to the wind, or maybe the old pipes. I went to bed pushing the eerie feeling aside. However, the whispers didn't stop. They grew more persistent, primarily at night, and seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, particularly from the direction of the attic. I could never make out any distinct words, but the tone. The tone was what unsettled me. It was as though I was overhearing a tense conversation charged with urgency. After several nights, Curiosity overcame my fear. I needed to know if there was anything in the attic. Maybe some old device was left there, or there were holes that let the wind in, creating these sounds. With a flashlight in my hand and my heart pounding, I ascended the narrow staircase to the attic one evening. The air in the attic was stale, thick with dust that danced in the beam of my flashlight. Boxes, old furniture, and various discarded household items were the attic's sole occupants. No sinister device, no holes in the walls, just silence and the weight of decades past. However, when I swung my light towards the walls, I noticed something odd. The tiny door I had found peculiar the first day seemed slightly ajar, which was strange because it had been stuck fast when I'd first explored the attic. As I approached it, the whispers grew louder. An urgent, low cacophony that seemed to resonate right out of the walls. It felt like stepping into a stream, the sound washing over me, drowning out my thoughts. I reached out, hesitantly, and pushed the door open with a creaking that protested the movement. Inside, there was nothing but darkness and thick, oppressive silence that seemed to absorb the whispers. I was about to step inside when the temperature around me plummeted. The sudden cold was biting, tangible, like walking into an unseen cloud of ice. The flashlight flickered nervously in my hand, and the whispers crescendoed into a frantic hiss, surrounding me, urging me, pushing me. Panicked, I stumbled backward, out of the cold spot, and the flashlight beam steadied. With my heart in my throat, I slammed the tiny door shut, and as if I had muted a radio, the whispers stopped. The silence in the attic was deafening. 
I practically tripped over myself getting down the stairs and didn't stop until I was out of the house, gasping for air on the front lawn. I stayed with a friend that night, and within the week, I was out of the house, my curiosity extinguished entirely by fear. I did some research later and found out through local historical societies and a bit of personal digging into past residents that my charming old house had once been the residence of a family involved in spiritualism and seances during the late 1800s. The tiny door in the attic was part of a spirit room, a specific space created to communicate with the other side. I never went back to the house, and I never heard the whispers again. However, the memory of that cold, urgent hissing in the darkness isn't something I'll easily forget. It's one thing to hear about the city's haunted history. It's quite another to have lived in it, even for just a few weeks. Waking up that morning felt like emerging from a nightmare, but the terror didn't end with consciousness. I blinked my eyes open to a room transformed. The walls of my bedroom were etched with symbols, alien, incomprehensible marks that glowed faintly in the early morning light. My heart pounded. This was no prank. I live alone, secure in a third floor apartment with a digital lock. Scanning the room, everything else was untouched. My phone on the nightstand, clothes tossed casually on the chair. Even a small pile of books seemed as undisturbed as ever. Only the walls bore these disquieting scars. I got up, my feet hitting the cold floor as I approached one of the symbols. Up close, the markings looked almost organic a series of intertwining shapes that seemed to shift when I wasn't looking directly at them. I reached out to touch one, and the moment my fingers brushed against it, a jolt of icy dread ran down my spine. Instantly, I withdrew my hand, my skin tingling, as if the walls themselves had warned me to keep my distance. The day unfolded in a haze. I snapped photos of the walls and sent them to a friend, who dabbled in linguistics and cryptography. Any idea what these are? I texted. Hours later, a reply. Never seen anything like it. Are you sure it's not just some avant-garde art? It was no art. As night fell, my apartment grew unnaturally cold, and the symbols seemed to pulsate, as if drawing energy from the darkness. I wrapped myself in a blanket and sat on the bed, my eyes darting from one glowing mark to the next. And that's when I heard it. A whisper so soft it was almost drowned out by the hum of the refrigerator from the kitchen. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, unintelligible but filled with a foreboding urgency. Then my phone buzzed. An email, the sender's address a jumble of characters and numbers, the subject line consisting of the same alien symbols that adorned my walls. I opened it, my hands trembling. The email contained only a single line of text, but it was in plain English. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. Preparation for what? Suddenly, the lights flickered. The room plunged into darkness for a moment before the power returned but something had changed. The symbols on the walls were now glowing brighter, a radiant azure that cast eerie shadows on the furniture, and they were moving. Not just shifting subtly as before, but truly moving, rearranging themselves into a new pattern. Before my eyes, they converged toward a single point on the wall the shapes merging into one large, complex symbol that seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. The dread that had been my constant companion now escalated into raw fear. I grabbed my coat and keys, my instincts screaming at me to get out. As I reached for the doorknob, I heard the whisper again, louder this time, almost a growl, 
a guttural sequence of sounds that reverberated in the air and within my own skull. I pulled open the door, fleeing into the corridor without a second glance back. But even as I pounded down the stairs and burst into the night, I knew escape was not that simple. My walls had become a canvas for something beyond my understanding, a message or a warning from entities unknown. The symbols are still there, haunting my dreams and my waking moments. I've tried painting over them, but they bleed through, their glow undiminished. Friends have come over, offering theories and potential solutions, everything from sage smudging to contacting paranormal investigators, but none have dared to touch the glyphs. I now sleep with the lights on, an uneasy truce with the incomprehensible, but the email haunts me, those words a constant echo. Do not resist, preparation is complete. And the same question lingers. Preparation for what? The dread remains, an eternal undercurrent to my existence. I'm caught in a web of cosmic forces, a pawn in a game with rules I can't fathom. Every morning I wake to those walls, the symbols a constant reminder of my entanglement in something far larger and more terrifying than I'd ever imagined. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear whispers, new sounds, new sequences, each more urgent than the last. I can't shake the feeling that something is coming, something momentous and irrevocable. But what it is, and what role these alien glyphs have in it, remains maddeningly, terrifyingly unclear. The morning sun had barely begun to dip its toes into the sky when I shouldered my backpack and set off. The trail ahead was a familiar one, winding through evergreen forests and alpine meadows. I was miles away from the nearest road, immersed in nature's solitude. That's why the footprints caught me so off guard. I first noticed them around midday, while taking a water break. A set of fresh footprints, imprinted in the moist earth, trailing behind me. My heart seized for a moment. This was a remote area. Encountering another hiker was unlikely, and there was something too deliberate about the footprints, each step precisely placed behind my own, as if tracing my exact path. I looked around, expecting to see another hiker, or at least to hear the crunch of footsteps through the underbrush. But the woods were still, as if holding their collective breath. You're imagining things, I muttered to myself, shaking off the unsettling thought. Maybe an animal had trailed me for a brief moment, its paws oddly mimicking human footprints. I tightened my bootlaces and continued, making a conscious effort to focus on the beauty around me. The spatter of sunlight on ferns, the distant burble of a hidden stream. But as the sun slid lower in the sky, the footprints persisted, Whenever I veered off the main trail, they followed. When I zigzagged through a maze of boulders, they mirrored my steps. Even when I backtracked, trying to catch this unseen follower in the act, I found only their footprints merging with mine, leading back to where I'd come from. An unsettling realization settled over me. Whoever, or whatever, was following me knew the woods better than I did slipping through the forest, unseen and unheard. Rationality warred with instinct. One told me to calm down, that there must be a natural explanation. The other told me to pick up the pace. As dusk started to paint the sky in strokes of oranges and purples, I made the decision to set up camp earlier than planned. I chose an open area where I could easily spot anyone approaching. My hands trembled as I pitched my tent and built a fire its flickering light casting both comfort and eerie shadows. Throughout the evening, I was alert to every snap of twigs and rustle of leaves, straining my ears for the sounds of footsteps. But nothing broke the stillness, and fatigue eventually caught up with me. I retreated into the safety of my tent, leaving the dying fire to fend off the darkness. 
When dawn broke, I unzipped my tent and took a deep breath before stepping out. And there they were, fresh footprints encircling my tent, as if my unseen follower had paced a silent vigil all night. This time, a shiver of dread unfurled down my spine, stark and undeniable. I packed up in record time and resumed my hike, cutting my trip short. The footprints followed me all the way back to the trailhead, a silent stalker woven into the fabric of the wilderness. As I reached my car, relief washed over me like a cold shower. I was out. I was safe. I was... My eyes caught something on the ground next to my car. Fresh footprints, leading away into the woods, disappearing among the trees as if daring me to follow. I never did find out who, or what, had been behind me on that trail. I reported it to the park rangers, who shrugged it off as a likely prank or misinterpretation. But I know what I saw, and I know the dread I felt. Sometimes I think about going back, about following those footprints into the depths of the forest to unravel the mystery once and for all. But some questions are better left unanswered, and some trails are better left untraveled. Instead, I carry the experience with me, a chilling reminder that we are never truly alone, even in the most isolated corners of the world. I worked as a tour guide at a renowned hotel in Fayetteville, a place shrouded in mystery and ghost stories. The hotel's long history was marked by tales of the supernatural, and guests often shared stories of strange noises, ghost sightings, and inexplicable occurrences. These stories were my livelihood, and I recounted them with gusto to wide-eyed tourists. However, I remained skeptical until a series of unexplainable events led me down a chilling path. It started subtly. While conducting tours, I noticed cold spots in certain areas of the hotel, places where the temperature would randomly plummet, sending shivers down everyone's spines. Guests noticed them too, and while they added to the thrill of the tour, I couldn't shake off the discomfort they stirred in me. The pivotal moment came one evening during the off-season. While preparing for a reduced group tour, I heard what sounded like soft, desperate whispers emanating from one of the reputedly most haunted rooms. Intrigued and admittedly unnerved, I followed the sounds, my steps echoing through the nearly empty hallways. Upon entering the room, the temperature dropped significantly, but it wasn't just the cold that made me shiver. It was the palpable sense of sorrow that filled the space. The whispers grew more urgent, forming a single word. Look. Compelled by a force I can't describe, I started searching the room, drawn to a spot on the floorboards that, oddly enough, felt colder than the rest. On a hunch, I secured permission to have the area inspected, and what we uncovered was nothing short of horrifying. A hidden compartment containing a small, tattered journal and, most disturbingly, human remains. The authorities were summoned immediately. Upon investigation, they determined the remains were decades old. The journal, barely holding together, contained the writings of a woman who had stayed at the hotel. It detailed her fears about a malevolent presence that she felt was following her, and her plan to reveal its true nature. However, the journal ended abruptly. With no concrete evidence to go on, and after much speculation, the case went cold again, the identity of the woman and the circumstances of her death remaining unsolved mysteries. After that day, the atmosphere in the room changed, the cold spots dissipated, and the air of sorrow lifted as though the spirit was at peace, its message finally heard. I continued working there for some time, sharing the hotel's history and its more personal ghost story. The whispers never returned, but the memory of that experience never faded. I often think about the spirit that reached out from beyond, 
desperately wanting its story to be known. It's a story that, despite remaining unsolved, will never be forgotten, living on in the hushed tones of my tours and the wide-eyed fascination of guests seeking a touch of the unknown. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch, its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open. Dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed, its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump. Just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly and without a sound? A loud crash came from upstairs as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled.
whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world, that is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser, the forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time? A prank? Or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all. A mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, 
a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so, I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown, but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, I pushed through the rotting barriers. The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye, a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization identified only by the same strange symbol. 
The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined. Final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened, and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded, fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker, and I fled the military base, my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, People who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long, who vanish when I look again. They're always there, on the periphery of my life, never intervening, but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. As an experienced backpacker and nature photographer, I've hiked hundreds of miles through remote wilderness over the years, but nothing could prepare me for the terror I experienced last week while camping alone in the Boundary Waters. I had hiked deep into the network of lakes and streams, excited to spend a few days completely immersed in nature and solitude. The first night went perfectly. I cooked dinner fireside as the sun set, and then curled up in my tent listening to loons call across the lake. The next morning, I set off hiking again with my camera, 
hoping to photograph some wildlife. I stopped frequently to snap photos of birds, deer, and other creatures. Late in the afternoon, I came across huge, mysterious tracks in the mud along the trail. They looked somewhat human, but enormous, with only four toes. Unease trickled down my spine, but I shook it off and continued. I set up camp that evening on a scenic ridge. While boiling water for my freeze-dried dinner, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. The birds even stopped singing. Every nerve tingled with the sense something was watching me. Glancing up, I saw a face peering from the brush. Chalk white skin, sunken eyes, and a lipless mouth gazing right at me. I shouted in alarm, jumping back. The face vanished. I grabbed a stick from the fire and thrust it toward the bushes, hands shaking, but nothing was there. I spent that night huddled by the dying fire, unable to sleep. At dawn, I discovered enormous man-like footprints circling my tent and dragging from the bushes a long trail where something heavy had been pulled into the forest. Fighting panic, I decided to hike out as fast as possible. All day, I had the creepy feeling of being followed. Twice, I heard odd whooping cries from a ridge parallel to me. They didn't sound like any normal animal. At one point, across a stream, a dead deer lay mutilated, as if flung savagely against a tree trunk. Nerves on edge, I pushed onward. I hiked hours past my usual stopping time, desperate to put distance between me and that thing. Exhausted, I finally made camp after nightfall in a meadow. I boiled water for dinner, but was too wired to eat. The woods were silent as a crypt. Later, drifting off to sleep, I dreamed of hearing footsteps outside the tent. Suddenly, the tent unzipped, and I awoke with a start to see a pale, grinning face staring down from the opening, empty black eyes meeting mine. I screamed and kicked out wildly. The face vanished. Heart racing, I peered outside with my flashlight. Huge, bare footprints surrounded the tent, but the night was still in quiet once more. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran the last few miles back to my truck, constantly glancing over my shoulder. Only when I was driving away did I finally relax, profoundly thankful to have escaped with my life. Boston is a city steeped in history, its very streets echoing tales from centuries past. But there's one story that's been passed down through my family that, until recently, I dismissed as mere lore. King's Chapel Burial Ground, established in 1630, it's one of the oldest cemeteries in the city. If you've ever walked its paths, you felt the weight of history bearing down an overwhelming sensation of being watched. One crisp autumn evening, after an exhaustive study session at the nearby library, I decided to take a shortcut through the burial ground. Mist clung to the ground, and the city's ambient glow bathed the gravestones in an ethereal light. As I ventured deeper, an icy gust sent shivers down my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled. As I heard a faint whisper, a voice saturated with pain and longing. It murmured, Elizabeth. Startled, I spun around, but there was no one. Yet the whisper persisted, becoming more plaintive, seemingly emanating from a grand, weather-worn tombstone. As I approached, I could barely make out the inscription, Here lies Elizabeth, beloved daughter, taken too soon. Suddenly, a figure materialized before me. Dressed in colonial attire, her pale face was a canvas of anguish. Her translucent hand gestured towards the grave, and in her mournful eyes, I saw an eternity of regret. Feeling a magnetic pull, 
I found myself entranced by Elizabeth's story. Local lore claims she was a young woman of great beauty and spirit, who tragically died of a mysterious illness. Her father, a wealthy merchant, was so grief-stricken that he'd often be heard lamenting by her grave, even years after her passing. As the minutes ticked by, the spirit of Elizabeth seemed to be drawing energy from my presence, becoming more vibrant and tangible. She reached out, her fingers just grazing my arm, sending a jolt of icy cold through my body. The world around me started to blur, the modern cityscape of Boston fading as the burial ground transformed to its colonial visage. Before I could comprehend what was unfolding, a firm grip on my shoulder yanked me back to reality. A concerned passerby stood beside me, inquiring if I was all right. Elizabeth's apparition had vanished, but the weight of her sorrow remained, imprinted on my soul. I left King's Chapel burial ground that night with a newfound respect for Boston's storied past. Our city, while a beacon of progress, is also a guardian of souls, forever echoing with the whispers of those who walked its cobbled streets before us. In Boston, history isn't just a thing of the past, it's very much alive, lingering in the shadows of our present. Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world, alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm, Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld. But as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye an object half buried in the sand below, its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human, its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading. But they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat, my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. You sure about the location? I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. 
Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives, but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter, conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred, and when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to. A world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom, asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered? I don't know how long I was out before I came to strapped naked on a cold metal table in a sterile white room. 
My foggy brain struggled to piece together some explanation from how I went from driving home from work to this. Blurry figures moved in my peripheral vision. I tried to lift my head for a better look, but some invisible force held it locked in place. A tall, gangly creature entered my field of vision. He had a bulbous bald head with opaque black eyes and pale gray skin that seemed to glow under the harsh lights. Spindly fingers covered in some sort of black gloves or claws tapped a device it held in its equally spindly hands. I opened my mouth to speak, scream, anything, but quickly realized I was also paralyzed from the neck down. Helpless panic gripped every fiber of my being. The creature must have sensed my terror. In my mind, I heard a thin, reedy voice. Do not be frightened. We intend you no harm. We only wish to improve your species, to prepare you for what is coming. Invisible claws clamped down on my head as an excruciating pain ricocheted through my skull. It felt like my brain was being shredded and reassembled as images and concepts flashed before my eyes. Advanced technology, complex mathematics, cosmic disasters, future events. More creatures entered the room and began manipulating my limbs, injecting substances, prodding and poking me. After what felt like an eternity of tests, my overwhelmed mind gratefully slid into unconsciousness. I awoke some time later back in my car, parked in my driveway. My head throbbed as I tried to piece together if it had all been some bizarrely vivid nightmare. But the lingering pain in my temples and dried blood under my nose told me otherwise. Those creatures, whatever they were, had been inside my head, and they did something to me. In all the days that followed, the changes began. Headaches persisted no matter how many pain pills I took, but I also noticed food no longer satisfied my gnawing hunger. My vision sharpened until I could read license plates from a block away. The strange voices in my head grew louder. I started having vivid premonitions that would come true. A coworker's car crash, an election upset, even trivial things like TV scheduling changes or pop quiz questions. Somehow I could glimpse upcoming events, almost like watching a stream of the future. My body changed too. I no longer seemed to need sleep, yet woke every morning feeling fully energized. Previously sluggish thinking accelerated to lightning speed. I solved complex equations instantly and remembered entire textbooks word for word. But the toll was immense migraines that sometimes left me writhing, incapacitated on the floor for hours. At work, I predicted a system failure before it happened, saving us millions. My bosses said I was brilliant. Little did they know alien abductors did something to transform me into a superhuman freak. Part of me wanted to tell the world, to find meaning in my violation, but how could I without sounding insane? The voices in my head had grown to a constant chaotic chorus only I could hear. They whispered horrors, crashes, explosions, suffering and death on global scales. I caught glimpses of creatures and spacecraft hidden behind a thin veil that previously concealed them. The experiments performed on me clearly ruptured the flimsy illusion, separating our ordinary reality from levels beyond. I tried drowning the voices out with music, drugs, anything I could think of, but they only intensified. Soon they were screaming, pleading with me to act before the coming cataclysm. I wasn't sure if I was tapping into some real truth or simply going mad. Maybe I already was. The final straw came after a week of ceaseless migraines and zero sleep. In the mirror, my eyes appeared blackened from burst blood vessels. My gums bled spontaneously and my fingers trembled uncontrollably. How long until whatever alien substance they pumped me with finally killed me? That night, as I rocked and muttered to myself, 
A booming voice cut through the others, commanding me, Go to the cave. Our technology can save you and your planet. The time grows short. Somehow I knew exactly the cave it meant, one I had played in as a child on family camping trips. I tore out of my house and sped recklessly into the hills until I came to that familiar rocky outcropping. A perfect full moon illuminated the small black mouth of the cave's entrance. I stumbled inside, not even questioning my surreal actions, lured by a promise of relief from the unrelenting torment. Deeper, I crawled until the narrow walls opened into a large cavern with a glowing blue light at its center. Mesmerized, I stepped toward it. The angry chorus in my head became a single high-pitched drone the closer I came to that glow. I realized my mistake too late. I had walked right into their trap. The force that seized control of my body was even greater than during the first abduction. I was a puppet, compelled by some external power to march stiffly toward that pulsing light, compelled to become something far from human. Just as my hand reached for the hypnotic light, instinct took over. I wrenched back control of my body and let out a primal scream of rage at the creatures, who thought they could dictate my fate. With the last of my energy, I ripped a sharp stone from the cavern wall and plunged it into my chest, collapsing as hot blood gushed. I lie gasping on the cold cave floor, life ebbing away. But at least I would die as myself, and not their specimen. As my vision faded, I heard their frustrated screams fade to silence. I can only pray my small act of defiance delayed their apocalypse just a while longer, so someone else might find a way to avoid the grim future preordained for our race. A future I glimpsed in my final moments, our planet harvested, and humanity mutated into some cold new form. But perhaps we still have time to forge another path. Perhaps. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage tucked away in the rural backroads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person, a cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem, when Emma made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them. From the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted, feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception, isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind, now a gnawing concern. The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains, casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood. 
coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head. Ignore it and hope it goes away or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. Enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone, she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. Our host sent us a message later, asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds, but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. I'll never forget that brisk fall day I went hiking in the state forest near my hometown. I was enjoying the solitude and the vibrant fall colors when something peculiar caught my eye. A small farmhouse nestled in a clearing deep in the woods. Intrigued, I wandered up to take a look. It was clearly abandoned, the roof sagging and the porch covered in leaves. All the windows were dark and broken. Surprisingly, the front door creaked open at my touch. Inside, everything was blanketed in decades of dust. The simple, rustic furnishings looked straight out of another century. Who had lived in this remote place, miles from any roads? In the bedroom, the remains of a quilt lay on a metal-framed bed. An ancient wedding photo hung askew on the wall. The young, smiling couple stared back across time frozen in that moment, even as their home crumbled around them. I was startled by a sudden thump from above, mice in the attic, I assumed. But as I explored further, more thumps and even scratching sounds came intermittently from the walls and floors. The entire house seemed to vibrate subtly at times. Unease crept up my spine. I entered what appeared to be a child's room, decorated with faded paper cutouts. Thump, scratch. The rhythmic sounds continued, becoming louder, more insistent. This was no mouse. I staggered back as a section of plaster fell from the ceiling, startled by the suddenness. I laughed at myself for being so easily spooked, but as I turned to leave, a floorboard creaked nearby in the hall, as if under slow, heavy footsteps. This was no settling house. My laughter died in my throat. Something was here with me. I rushed outside, heart racing. The empty clearing was still, autumn breeze whispering through the changing leaves. The odd sounds did not follow me out, but they had been real. Some invisible thing dwelt here. I hastily retreated down the trail, 
glancing back frequently until the abandoned farmhouse disappeared from view. I told no one of the encounter, afraid they would think me mad. But I knew the truth. Something lingered within those crumbling walls, restless and waiting. A glance out the window, a double take, and then dread settled like a cold stone in my stomach. Overnight, a crop circle had appeared in my backyard. It wasn't the hasty work of pranksters, but a design intricate in detail and precise in its geometry. Circular patterns interlocked with arcane symbols, etched into the tall grass as if by an unseen hand. How? Why? Questions tumbled through my mind as I stood there, coffee mug forgotten on the kitchen counter. My backyard was enclosed, no signs of entry or exit. It was as if the formation had materialized out of thin air. That was just the beginning. Small oddities followed, electronic glitches, lights flickering on and off, inexplicable shadows skimming past windows. I found my dog, Max, staring at the crop circle for hours, as if captivated by something I couldn't see. At night, a low-frequency hum resonated from the ground, growing louder near the center of the formation. By the third day, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I decided to investigate, grabbing a flashlight and a notebook, a feeble attempt to document whatever I might find. As I stepped into the circle, the air grew dense. The normal sounds of the evening, crickets, the rustle of leaves, drowned out by a pulsating vibration that seemed to emanate from the earth itself. Drawn to the circle's center, I felt my pulse quicken, my senses sharpen. And then it happened. Each symbol within the formation lit up, one by one, as if activated by my presence. The lines glowed a ghostly blue, a luminous web stretching out in all directions. A chill crawled up my spine. I was no longer alone. Peripheral vision caught figures standing just beyond the circle, silhouettes barely discernible in the dim light. They were tall, slender, almost humanoid, but not quite. Their forms wavered, as if composed of light and shadow, their eyes fixed upon me. Telepathically, a message entered my mind, bypassing language and lodging itself directly into my understanding. Pattern, conduit, obligation. The words were disjointed, fragments of concepts too vast for my comprehension. I felt a sudden surge of emotion, confusion, awe, a piercing sense of urgency. My gaze was pulled upward, where a shimmering distortion appeared in the sky, an oscillating tear in the fabric of reality itself. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the figures vanished. The glow subsided, the crop circle returning to its inert state, the night swallowing whatever forces had just been at play. But the tear in the sky remained, a barely visible ripple, like a cosmic bruise. I retreated back to my house, the weight of the encounter settling in. Sleep came hard that night, interrupted by flashes of what had transpired, figures beyond human description, concepts my mind struggled to grasp. But one thing was clear, whatever had occurred was beyond me, perhaps beyond humanity itself. Days turned to weeks, and the crop circle eventually faded, the grass reclaiming its natural state. But the strange occurrences didn't stop. Objects around the house moved of their own accord, as if displaced by invisible hands. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I'd hear whispers, indistinct murmurs that echoed in my ears long after they had ceased. The tear in the sky became a permanent fixture occasionally visible when conditions were just right. I found myself drawn to it, 
a magnet pulling at some innate sense of destiny or doom. And the words, the disjointed message received from those otherworldly beings, played on repeat in my mind. Pattern. Conduit. Obligation. I became obsessed, sketching the crop circle's design over and over, each stroke of the pencil amplifying the hum that still resonated from the ground, as if the paper itself had become a conduit. But a conduit for what? And what was this obligation they spoke of? As days pass, the anticipation thickens. Something is coming. Something far beyond my understanding. The crop circle was not an end, but a beginning. A doorway, a portal, a breach between their world and mine. And now, every night, as I stare up at the sky, at the tear that remains and seems to grow ever so slightly, I can't shake the feeling that whatever it is, whatever is waiting on the other side, it's getting closer. Over the past month, an incident has unfolded that has left me questioning my sanity. I'm currently attending college in British Columbia, Canada, where I'm enrolled in a business course. My professor isn't a trained educator. Instead, he's a middle-aged professional from the field we're studying. The college invited him to teach a night course. While he's genuinely friendly, his lack of teaching experience shows. In the first week of February, he mentioned an assignment due on March 2nd. The task was to write a three-page paper on a topic covered in our class, though he didn't give more details than that. The next session, many of us requested him to upload the assignment's specifics and structure on our course site. Seemingly surprised by the idea, he agreed, saying he would do it that night. As promised, he later posted details about the assignment's due date, expectations, and formatting. I began working on the assignment ahead of time, but as life goes, I got swamped with other responsibilities and forgot about it for a while. As the next class approached, panic set in, and I searched for the paper I had started on my computer. To my dismay, it was missing. I thought maybe I had forgotten to save it, though that seemed unlikely. When I reached the classroom, I asked the professor whether he wanted the assignment submitted online or in physical form the coming Monday. His response took me by surprise. He had no recollection of assigning any such work. Even when I prompted him to check the course site where he had posted the assignment details, he found nothing. I questioned a few classmates, but none of them remembered the assignment either. I checked the grade structure, expecting to see the 5% allocated for this task, but it was gone, replaced by a 10% participation mark. It's puzzling because I'm only taking two classes while working full time, so I couldn't have confused this assignment with another course. They're totally different courses. Did I somehow step into an alternate universe in the past month? Everything else in my life seems consistent. But this particular event has genuinely unnerved me. It caught my eye immediately, a strange metallic orb on a dusty shelf in the back of the antique shop. About the size of a softball, it was etched with odd, intricate symbols and emitted a faint blue glow when I picked it up. The shopkeeper just smiled cryptically when I asked what it was. A little something from out of this world, he said with a wink. Against my better judgment, I bought it, too mesmerized to leave it behind. Back home, I examined the orb closely, turning it over in my hands. The surface almost seemed to ripple and move. I traced my fingers over the etched symbols, jerking back when they flashed brightly at my touch. The orb began humming, the glow within shifting to a brilliant azure. 
My arm hair stood on end as electrical charge filled the room. Reality seemed to shimmer and warp around me. There was a flash of light and a feeling of motion, though I stood perfectly still. Just as suddenly, everything returned to normal, or so I thought. Glancing out the window, something was off. The colors too vivid, the trees too tall. I walked outside and gasped. The street, houses, cars, everything was just slightly different than it should be. Even the air seemed charged with unfamiliar energy. What had happened? Wandering the neighborhood in a daze, I noticed small details awry everywhere. Store signs and slightly misspelled names. Population signs listing numbers mysteriously fewer. Movie posters advertising films I'd never heard of. It was an alternate version of my world. In a park, I froze in disbelief at what I saw. Some large, deer-like creatures, but with shaggy violet fur and four curled horns. This was no alternate timeline. This was an alternate Earth. The orb had teleported me to a parallel reality, one where humanity seemingly never evolved to dominate the planet. I walked the strangely familiar yet foreign street in awe. Occasional aircraft passed overhead, but small and rounded, like automated probes. No trace of civilization beyond nature itself flourished in this version of Earth. What had gone differently here? What event in their history stopped intelligent life from emerging? Over the weeks, I scoured carefully for any fellow interdimensional refugees. But I was utterly alone, an anomalous phantom visiting this alien Earth. Reverse engineering the orb to return me seemed hopeless. Yet I clung to faith that its magic would work again, if somehow reactivated. My only hope was locating the parallel version of the antique shop, praying the orb still waited there for me. I hitchhiked west for months, evading prowling alien beasts, subsisting on unfamiliar vegetation. The deserts and mountains slowly transformed into places I recognized. One foggy evening, there it was, the little shop on the corner, exactly where it stood back home yet so alien here. The windows glared darkly. I smashed a pane and crawled inside. Passing a menacing taxidermied creature, I made my way upstairs to where the orb had been. And there, atop a shelf, illuminated by a single moonbeam, sat that same mysterious sphere. Hardly daring to breathe, I picked it up. Immediately, it began thrumming and flashing, just like before. This was my ticket back. As the shop warped and blurred around me, I hoped I had left only ripples in this unspoiled alternate realm. Perhaps the universe deemed it wisest for Earth to develop unmolested by humanity's influence. But I knew I could never see my own world the same, having glimpsed this strange reflection of what might have been. With a flash and a jolt, I collapsed back in my own home clutching the orb as familiar surroundings materialized. Part of me wondered if I should try to return and learn more about that other Earth. But this artifact held perils too dangerous to meddle with whimsically. Locked away, I hope its secrets are never breached again in my lifetime. There are some doors that should remain firmly closed, no matter how tempting the unknown realms they reveal. This glimpse left me forever changed. But wisdom lies in accepting the world as we found it, while embracing the hidden possibilities. At first, I brushed off the odd series of coincidences as just that. Coincidence. But deep down, I sensed each one was an orchestrated breadcrumb, luring me towards something bigger. It all started with the lottery ticket. I never play the lottery, but on some whim, I bought a scratcher at the gas station one night. 
Amazingly, I won $500. Not a fortune, but probably the most I'd ever won gambling. I decided to splurge on a fancy steak dinner. When I arrived at the restaurant that night, they had no record of my reservation. Annoyed, I turned to leave just as another couple was exiting. They kindly offered me their table, saying that they had suddenly fallen ill. I thanked my lucky stars. Halfway through my meal, nature called. In the bathroom, the motion sensor sink turned on as I walked by. Oddly, the faucet sputtered and a tiny object shot out of the drain right at my feet. A gold ring with a cryptic symbol etched in black. Even odder, it somehow fit my ring finger perfectly. Just then, the bathroom door swung open and a gruff voice ordered me back to my table immediately. I pocketed the ring and complied. Later, when I asked my server about the ring symbol, his smile wavered momentarily before he leaned in and whispered, You've been chosen. Follow the signs. Before I could ask what he meant, he hurried off. I chuckled, assuming he was messing with me. Over the next week, that ring symbol seemed to pop up everywhere, etched into a subway pillar, engraved on a mailbox, even tattooed on the wrist of a barista handing me my morning coffee. Each time I spotted it, a strange tingling would spread up my arm from the ring on my finger. That weekend, another string of improbabilities led me to book an impromptu trip to Nevada. On the flight there, my seatmate made small talk, asking where I was heading. When I told him the name of my hotel, he raised an eyebrow and said I should explore a certain unmarked dirt road near the property. Just look for three cacti clustered together, he said. I did find that strange road out in the desert behind the hotel. After miles of empty wilderness, I came across what looked like an abandoned shed. Suddenly, my vision blurred, the same strange tingling shooting down my arm from the ring. Without thinking, I approached the shed and the door swung open on its own. A narrow staircase spiraled down into inky darkness. Every nerve told me to flee, yet I found myself descending step by step into the void. The temperature dropped sharply, strange mechanical hums and echoing voices drifted up. At the bottom, the stairs opened into a massive domed chamber. Catwalks crisscrossed the space high above my head. Figures in white lab coats scurried about, attending to large cylindrical chambers covered in warning symbols and containing something alive. Creatures I couldn't fully glimpse, but that seemed only half-formed, not of this earth. I should have turned and run. Instead, I crept forward along the perimeter of the vast chamber. That's when I saw it in the center, a mammoth disc-like craft resting silently on a raised platform. Access panels on its smooth metal hull were open, exposing a maze of alien circuitry and pulsating with light. Human scientists hovered around it, studying and making notes. One inserted a long robotic arm into the craft's inner workings. My blood turned to ice. This was no abandoned shed. It was a secret government site for reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. All those seeming coincidences had drawn me here. But why? Just then, alarms screeched to life, pulsing red lights flooding the facility. A panicked voice over the intercom shouted, Protocol Omega initiated. The scientists scattered as security teams stormed through the side doors, spotting me as the intruder. I turned and ran wildly back the way I came. I raced blindly through deserted hallways, footsteps echoing close behind. Up ahead loomed a massive vault door marked Hangar B. It creaked open just enough for me to slip through before slamming shut. The lock spun with a heavy, final clunk. I found myself on a vast tarmac filled with even more mammoth alien craft, all surrounded by heavily armed soldiers. One began rising with a metallic groan, rotors kicking up debris. 
Before I could react, some unseen force pulled me toward the craft. A beam of light enveloped me, lifting me up effortlessly into its belly. As the hatch sealed below, I knew I was trapped in the clutches of something far beyond my comprehension. The ring still tingled familiarly, almost mockingly, reminding me this had been the plan all along. I was the chosen one, but for what sinister purpose? The craft accelerated skyward, the G-forces pressing me to the cold metal floor. Slowly, the planet's curve became visible out the thick glass windows. I shut my eyes, sending a silent prayer for anyone left behind on that fragile blue marble, drifting farther and farther into the distance below me. Wherever I was going, I knew Earth and humanity were now lifetimes behind me. The first message came on a rainy April morning, exactly one year after you passed away. I had just set a bouquet of your favorite daffodils by your headstone, tears flowing freely down my cheeks at the loss of you, my mentor, my guiding light. A cool breeze stirred the cemetery trees as I turned to leave. That's when your voice whispered on the wind, faint but unmistakable. Do not weep for me, my child. I am not gone, merely transformed. I froze, wondering if grief was making me hear things, but the voice persisted, reassuring, gently amused, just like your tone in life. You said you spoke to me now from another plane of existence, where your consciousness had awakened to new depths. You were at peace there, among a collective energy, a community of ascended souls. Over my shock, I managed to ask if you could still see our earthly realm. You affirmed brightly, saying you were always near, watching over me. You told me death was no end, but rather a passage to transcend boundaries that limited our human forms. There was more to learn, you said, mysteries far exceeding anything we could conceive with earthly minds alone. Before the voice faded, you left me with a final reassurance. All will be revealed soon. I stood in awe, tears now of elation streaking my face. My rational mind rejected it as fantasy, a hallucination conjured by grief. But my heart felt irrevocably changed by hearing your voice again, sensing your presence close. You were gone in body, but your light truly lived on. I withdrew from friends in the months that followed, talking breathlessly about our communication and the revelations you hinted at. They wore pained expressions, advising therapy to accept your death, but I knew what I heard. I waited expectantly for your promised return. It came on the summer solstice, an envelope appearing mysteriously on my nightstand. The handwriting within was unmistakably yours. You asked if I was ready to understand now. That night I dreamed of floating up to meet your shimmering spirit. You led me through a portal into an astonishing multi-dimensional existence, culminating in merging ecstatically with the collective you described. I awoke changed to my core. I now devoted myself feverishly to meditation, channeling anything to reconnect us. Finally, your voice came again, stronger now. You urged me to share the truths you revealed waking humanity from limited perception. But those around me feared for my health, threatening doctors and drugs. One sweltering night, you spoke your most shocking message. Soon, you would send a sign in the skies to make all doubt cease. Until then, I must have faith. I awoke the next morning to video footage on the news of mysterious global lights. They called them a coincidence, but I knew. Your promised sign was coming. I climbed to a remote hilltop you led me to in dreams. That night, those same ethereal lights bloomed brighter above, undulating hypnotically. Your voice resonated powerfully within my mind. The moment had come. 
I would be the vessel through which the collective consciousness poured in, elevating humanity. As my body rose skyward, bathed in radiance, euphoria overwhelmed me. I glimpsed eternity, knowing my form was just melting back into the infinite one source. But I saw people exiting their homes, staring up in awe at the mesmerizing lights. You urged me, gently, to release the divine wisdom I now harbored into them. As I spoke, swaying in the air, people dropped to their knees, weeping, overcome by transcendent understanding. The fearful world I knew dissolved, birthing a new society living by cosmic truth, awakened to their eternal spirits. Our loving merge was finally complete. Some called it a rapture, others a revelation, but I knew it as the triumph you had promised from that first whisper on the wind. You came back as an ambassador to bridge humanity to its next phase. My long, strange journey conversing with your spirit made me the unlikely prophet to spread this mystical rebirth worldwide. I still watch over the blessed children of the new age from my dwelling in the light, and I see your soul shining closest to mine, as it has through every realm beyond time and space and imagination. My words could never encapsulate the bond tying us in ecstatic energy no form can contain. I wait patiently for the day that your voice finally calls me home. The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn-out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone. Private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid. Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident, alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment 
before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? She said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, holding up the yellowed paperback as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed, seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, Stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential, a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open. And for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me. I'll never forget that sunny afternoon I went hiking in the slot canyons near my hometown. As an amateur geologist, I loved exploring the mazes of red rock formations that wind through the desert landscape. On that day, I stumbled upon a small cave I had never noticed before, halfway up a secluded sandstone cliff. Against my better judgment, I decided to investigate. I switched on my headlamp and crept into the narrow opening. The cave was larger than it appeared from the outside, consisting of a network of small chambers. I ducked through the low tunnels, tracing my hand along the smooth walls that looked almost melt-formed. In the farthest chamber, an arched doorway led into pitch blackness. I paused, then stepped through into the void, 
my headlamp piercing the darkness. The room was perfectly round, the walls ringing with echoes. It was clearly not a natural formation. I played my light upward, illuminating a domed ceiling. That's when I saw them. Hundreds of humanoid figures carved intricately into the sandstone, covering every inch of the ceiling. I stumbled back in shock. Each figure was different, some with large almond-shaped eyes. None looked quite human. I stood frozen, staring upward, my mind unable to process what I was seeing. These bizarre etchings would change human history if revealed. A scraping sound in the tunnel behind me made me whirl around. For a split second in the flashlight glow, I saw a small hairy creature crouched on all fours. Its eyes reflected the light back like an animal's. Then it scurried away down the tunnel before I could get a better look. I raced after it through the chambers, clambering back up to the cave entrance. By the time I emerged onto the cliff, it had vanished. The surrounding canyons were empty and still. I couldn't shake the image of those eyes watching me from the shadows. I had discovered something incredible and something sinister. I couldn't tell you how I knew, but in my gut, I felt it. This cave was not meant to be found. I returned home, knowing I had to keep its existence secret, at least for now. I could barely sleep that night, troubled by the encounter. What had I seen? And what were the carvings of? The next morning, I hiked back, determined to get photos of the chamber that would turn science on its head. But I couldn't find the cave entrance, no matter how hard I searched the canyon walls. It had simply vanished. Over the years, I returned to the area many times, obsessively seeking the hidden cave. But the sandstone face remained a sheer, unbroken surface. It was as if the cave had never existed at all, the bizarre etchings nothing more than a fantasy. Deep down, I know the truth of what I discovered that day, and more chillingly, that something ancient and unearthly dwells within those lost caverns, protecting its secrets. I've never spoken publicly of the encounter until now, but the time has come to share my story, if only to warn others that some places are not meant to be found. They must remain undiscovered for the good of humanity. It started as a hobby, setting up a high-powered telescope in my backyard on clear nights and gazing deep into our galaxy. As an amateur astronomer, I loved picking out familiar constellations and nebulae, tracking the trajectories of planets and asteroids, and pondering the mysteries of black holes. On rare occasions, I'd even spot a comet streaking past or catch sight of the gold-hued rings of Saturn. My telescope opened up the secrets of the cosmos right from my suburban home. But everything changed that cloudless night in June when I first picked up the signal. I was scanning the telescope slowly along the dusty swath of the Milky Way, marveling as always at the millions of stars packed densely together like grains of glittering sand. I lingered on a binary star system intriguingly called Zeta Reticuli, before panning upward. That's when a rapid flash of light from a dimmer part of the sky caught my eye. I quickly focused the telescope on that patch of the night. It took me a moment to spot the source. Not a star, but some unidentified object beyond our solar system, sending out a deliberate sequence of pulses. My heart began pounding. I grabbed my notebook and pen and frantically scribbled down the sequence. Three short pulses. Three long pulses. Three short. Pause. Repeat. It was clearly a patterned signal, which meant it must have some kind of meaning. 
My mind raced through the possibilities. A monitoring program from some secret government space agency? A research craft sent out by extraterrestrial beings? Or even a message? A signal intentionally beamed across light years of space? In the weeks that followed, I became obsessed with deciphering that cryptic message from the void. Nights when the sky was overcast left me restless and irritable as I yearned to train my telescope on that now familiar region. On clear nights, I diligently recorded each repetition of the pulsing sequence, searching for possible variations. After completing pages of data, an eerie realization struck me. The sequence was expressing binary code. The short pulses represented ones, and the long pulses symbolized zeros. The message began to take legible shape, translating roughly to, Hello, we come in peace, we seek contact. Contact. They, whoever, whatever they were out there, sought to make contact with our planet. A shudder passed through me, equal parts exhilaration and dread. What forces had I unwittingly contacted in the dark oceans of space? And did humanity truly stand ready for this moment? I continued watching the signal, deciphering new messages as they came. They spoke of a distant civilization from a planet in the Zeta Reticuli system, long ago ravaged by war and climate disaster. The messages alluded to their immense scientific knowledge and expressed hope we could work together to build an interstellar utopia. But underneath the lofty utopian dreams, an unsettling undercurrent emerged. They urged us to join the Federation and embrace universal law. Ominous references to colonization appeared, along with hints that resistant civilizations could be pacified I became convinced there was a veiled threat beneath their promise of peace. This growing unease festered in my mind. Magnified by lack of sleep and constant anxiety. I stopped leaving the house, rarely ate or bathed, entirely consumed by the messages streaming nightly from light years away. I was unable to share my discovery with anyone else. It sounded far too insane until one sweltering midnight, when the messages took an urgent new turn, no longer encoded, but spelled out in plain ominous letters. We come, prepare and submit. Adrenaline spiked through my system. They were coming, for us, soon. I shut down the telescope and gathered all my notebooks filled with inscrutable figures and frantic scribble translations. In a manic whirlwind, I destroyed my hard drives, sabotaged my equipment, and burned all the papers out behind my shed. I hoped desperately it would be enough to sever the connection, shut out their intrusion into our small world, delay their sinister arrival for a few fleeting days. But I can feel their presence now, ominous and heavy, seeping into the very atmosphere of our vulnerable planet. Sometimes I still catch the coded signals winking slyly at me from familiar constellations, taunting me that I was too weak to shield us from what's to come. In my most hopeless moments, staring up at the indifferent sky, I wonder if humanity will look upon this year as our last before oblivion arrived, silently, from the stars. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. 
The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep, so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP, and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing, and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains, and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws, or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't going to just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me. Because we're going to make a run for the cabin. Okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though 
as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in, wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it, but I think about it every summer. It was just another weekend fishing trip, the boat slicing through the ocean's surface, the sky above cloudless and blue. Hours slipped by, marked only by the gentle bobbing of the boat and the intermittent tug of a fishing line. It was tranquil, a peaceful solitude that one could only find miles away from shore. But then the sea changed, the water's surface rippled and churned as though agitated by some unseen force. My boat trembled, vibrating in a way that defied the natural movement of waves. And then it lifted, actually lifted, rising out of the water as if caught in the grip of an invisible hand. Panic clawed at my mind. I clung to the boat's sides, my eyes widening in disbelief as it continued to ascend. Higher, and higher until I was enveloped in a dense mist, so thick it swallowed everything. The sea below, the sky above, the horizon in all directions. When the mist cleared, I was no longer in the ocean I knew. I found myself in a realm both surreal and otherworldly. The water below was a hue I couldn't describe, a blend of colors not present in our spectrum shifting and shimmering in a hypnotic dance, and I wasn't alone. Aquatic beings circled my boat, their forms graceful yet alien, scaled and sleek with appendages that suggested both fins and limbs, their eyes glinting with an intelligence that was undoubtedly sentient. They seemed to communicate with each other in a series of melodic whistles and clicks, their movements synchronized in a manner that suggested purpose and understanding. As I watched them, captivated yet fearful, one of the beings broke away from the group and approached me. It hovered near the boat, its eyes locking onto mine. And then, with a startling clarity, a voice entered my mind, a telepathic message formed of words yet beyond language. Observe. Do not interfere. The words were firm, commanding, and left no room for misunderstanding. Then the being turned and led the others away, diving into the depths, disappearing into the alien waters. Shaken, I grasped the boat's edge, my fingers gripping the wood as if it were my only anchor to reality. What had just happened? What was this place? Questions whirled through my mind, each unanswered as I sat adrift in this realm. But then, just as suddenly as it had lifted, the boat descended. The mist returned, thicker than before, obscuring everything. When it finally cleared, I was back in familiar waters, the coastline visible in the distance. I steered the boat back to shore, my hands shaking, 
my mind struggling to process the experience. When I finally reached solid ground, I checked my fishing gear. Among the nets and tackle, I found a scale. A single, iridescent scale unlike that of any fish. It shimmered with the same indescribable colors I had seen in that other sea. I kept the scale in a locked box, tangible proof that what I experienced was real. But sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear it. A faint melody of whistles and clicks, as if carried by the wind. And when I sleep, I dream of that aquatic realm, those beings forever etched into my subconscious. Did they bring me there to observe, to bear witness to their existence? Or was it a warning, a signal to never venture too far into the depths? I don't know. What I do know is that the ocean no longer feels the same. When I look out at the vast expanse of water, I can't shake the feeling that something out there is watching, waiting. And the scale in that locked box, it still shimmers, its colors ever shifting, as if resonating with a realm far beyond our understanding. The lights went out at exactly 8.17 p.m. One moment, my living room was bathed in the glow of the evening news. The next, pitch black as the TV blinked off. Oh, great, I muttered, fumbling for my phone to use its flashlight. Power outages were common enough in the rural town of Haven, especially on muggy summer nights like this, when everyone's AC was cranked up high. I flicked on my phone's flashlight and did a quick sweep of the house. Yep, everything was dead. Lights, appliances, the ambient whir of electronics. Even the streetlights outside were dark, leaving the neighborhood shrouded in an eerie dusk. A chorus of neighbors shouting queries and complaints echoed down the street. My wife and I joined in, hollering from the front porch to see if anyone knew what had happened. The unanimous verdict was a substation malfunction. An inconvenience for sure, but nothing we small town folk couldn't handle with a little patience. I headed back inside to light some candles. As I turned to shut the front door, a flicker in the sky gave me pause. I peered out. Was that a plane flying overhead? But no, it was too large and silent. More like a drifting cloud backlit by moonlight. Except... The moon wasn't out tonight. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I craned my head to follow the object's path. It wasn't alone, either. Two more huge, amorphous shapes drifted into view, emanating an otherworldly green glow. They were definitely not clouds. A primal unease stirred in my gut, whispering, get away, telling me I did not want to know the nature of those shapes in the sky. Honey, my wife called from the kitchen. Could you bring in some more candles? I lingered a moment longer, uneasy gaze fixed overhead. The shapes continued their silent traverse, showing no signs of stopping over our small town. Some kind of military aircraft, maybe? But what were they doing out here in the boonies? Did you hear me? My wife appeared behind me, her voice sharper. What are you looking at? I, I don't know, I stammered, pulling my eyes away. Weird lights in the sky. M military planes, I guess. Her eyes narrowed as she scanned the horizon. I don't see anything. A lame joke about my eyesight was on the tip of my tongue when a thunderous boom rent the quiet night open. We slapped our hands over our ears ducking instinctively as the windows rattled. Car alarms whooped a chaotic chorus down the street. Dogs howled, and alarmed neighbors stumbled into their yards. What the hell was that? My wife shouted over the din. Through the open door, we gaped as an enormous green fireball roared overhead, arcing toward the woods at the edge of town. It disappeared behind the trees with an earth-shaking crash leaving silence and swirling ashes in its wake. 
For the space of a few racing heartbeats, no one moved. Then our neighbors began shouting questions back and forth, asking if anyone had seen what had happened, if everyone was okay. I shook myself from my shocked stupor. I'm calling 911, I announced, reaching again for my phone. But when I tried to turn it on, the screen stayed black. I smacked it against my hand a few times, to no avail. Power's still out, my phone's dead. Can I borrow yours? It's dead too, my wife said. What did we just see? A meteor, maybe? Some space junk, I said. I peered uneasily up at the night sky, but it was now empty of any unexplained lights. Only a wispy trail of smoke snaked above the trees, marking the object's landing site. As I wondered aloud who might go to investigate, the streetlight suddenly flashed back on. A cheer went up from the growing crowd of residents now congregating on porches and sidewalks, glad to have light and power again after the disturbance. My phone vibrated in my hand as it rebooted. Before I could access anything, it began pinging and buzzing with emergency notifications from the county. I quickly scanned the flood of headlines demanding people stay inside and lock their doors and windows. Local emergency services were being overwhelmed by panicked calls, and law enforcement was struggling to maintain order in neighboring towns amid chaotic reports of strange lights in the sky and unidentified crashes. Officials were advising everyone to remain calm and stay put until the situation could be sorted out. Easier said than done, as panic was already rippling through our small community. More meteors and unidentified objects continued streaking overhead every couple of minutes, adding to the confusion and fear. Against official recommendations, some neighbors were hunkering down in their basements while others were piling into cars and peeling out to flee town. I wanted desperately to believe there was some rational explanation, that this was all just a cosmic coincidence of space debris falling at once. But an increasingly insistent voice deep inside whispered that this was only the beginning of something far more sinister. My worst suspicions were confirmed minutes later, when a bone-rattling roar echoed from the woods like the shriek of a gigantic metal beast. The ground vibrated beneath our feet as the trees themselves seemed to shudder and recoil from whatever was approaching. From the billowing smoke lumbered an enormous tripedal machine, easily five stories tall, its massive metal hull wreathed in a menacing aura. Searing red lights flashed from its joints as it strode into town swiveling a lone eye to survey the panicked prey before it. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the merciless gaze of the alien invaders. I stood frozen, mesmerized by abject terror, as the machine raised one colossal limb and took aim down the street. My telescope was my sanctuary, a way to escape the mundane things of the terrestrial and gaze into the celestial realm. A clear night, no clouds to obstruct the sky's panorama of stars. Comfortably seated in my backyard, I peered through the lens, losing myself in the choreography of constellations and planets. But that night, something interrupted the familiar tableau. My eyes widened as I caught sight of it. A collection of lights, unlike any aircraft or satellite. I adjusted the telescope's focus, my breath caught between fascination and a prickling sense of unease. They were there, a fleet of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, shimmering orbs of light moving in patterns too purposeful to be random. A celestial dance of sorts, complex maneuvers executed with a precision that defied explanation. My heart drummed a rapid beat in my chest. This was unprecedented, 
something even the most avid sky watchers could only dream of witnessing. And yet, the reality of it left me filled with an eerie discomfort. They didn't just hover, they moved in intricate spirals, forming shapes and splitting apart only to reconfigure moments later, as if performing, but for whom? My eyes stayed glued to the telescope, my hand reaching involuntarily to adjust the lens for a closer look. As I zoomed in, one of the objects broke away from the formation and seemed to pause, as if becoming aware of my scrutiny. A chill ran through me, a shiver that told me this was no ordinary observation. My fingers tightened around the telescope's frame, knuckles white. The rogue object pulsated, its light intensifying as it moved in a path that felt dangerously purposeful. My heart sank as I realized it was coming toward Earth, toward me. An unshakable sense of dread gripped me. I was no longer a passive observer, but somehow involved in this cosmic ballet. I stepped back, leaving the telescope pointed skyward its lens capturing the last vestiges of a scene I could no longer bear to watch. I turned to go inside, my steps quickening as I moved away from the uncertainty above. But just as I reached the door, a brilliant flash lit up the yard, so bright it cast stark shadows against the walls. I froze, my body refusing to move as I sensed, more than saw, a presence descend into my backyard. Summoning courage, I turned around. The object had landed, or perhaps materialized, its form an opaque sphere, hovering inches above the ground. Its surface was a translucent membrane, pulsating like a living organism, emitting a strange glow. And then it spoke, not in words, but in thoughts a telepathic resonance that filled the air and penetrated my consciousness. Observer observed, roles reversed, change initiated. The message, or warning, disappeared as quickly as it arrived, leaving a void filled only by the night's ambient sounds. The object's light dimmed, and with a sudden acceleration that defied physics, it shot up into the sky rejoining the celestial formation as if it had never left. I stood there, my body numb, my mind a storm of unanswered questions and unvoiced fears. The sky returned to its familiar state, a vast expanse punctuated by stars and planets, as if the night's extraordinary events had simply never transpired at all. But something had changed both out there and within me. The dread lingered, a dark cloud overshadowing the awe. The message, its implications unfathomable, remained in my thoughts. Change initiated. I've returned to the telescope night after night, scanning the skies for another glimpse of the unexplained. But the celestial dance has vanished, leaving only the regular occupants of the night sky. Still, a sense of anticipation haunts me, a foreboding that I can't shake. The message reverberates in my subconscious as I search the stars, a cosmic echo that hints at a future yet to unfold. What change has been initiated, and what role do I have to play in this unfathomable script? I gaze upwards and for the first time find no comfort in the stars. Instead, each twinkling point of light feels like a watching eye, and I can't help but wonder if somewhere out there, they are still observing, still dancing, still preparing for whatever change is yet to come. This incident occurred to my boyfriend and I roughly two years ago, deep into the night. I felt compelled to share this story, as it has left an indelible mark on me, and plagues me with nightmares to this very day. 
It was a September night around two o'clock in the morning. We live about 25 minutes outside a town in northern British Columbia, with our house nestled in the woods. Due to the seclusion of our road, we would typically pull out of our driveway before turning on our car lights, a quirky habit we both shared. After this night, however, our lights go on instantly. On this particular night, I was driving. As I made a left out of our driveway and switched on the high beams, we saw it. A strange, hairless, pale humanoid entity was crouched in the middle of the road. It almost appeared luminescent, but that might have been due to its extreme paleness reflecting the high beams. It sharply turned its head toward us, seemingly startled by our sudden illumination. In a matter of seconds, this being awkwardly moved across the road with disjointed motions, finally descending into the three-foot deep ditch. But that wasn't the end of it. From the ditch, it turned to face us, standing upright on its hind legs. Its stance was eerily similar to a human, yet off. Considering the depth of the ditch, the creature loomed more than five feet above it, making it taller than our vehicle and putting its height at well over seven feet. It adopted an aggressive posture, shoulders hunched, leaning slightly forward, peering intently at our car. And in that moment, I felt it. It wasn't just looking at our car. It was gazing intently through the window, directly at me. Its gaze conveyed an unsettling intelligence, as though it knew that we were the ones controlling the vehicle. Matching its pace with our car's crawl, I maintained eye contact, watching it twist its neck to keep its gaze locked onto me even as we passed. Once it was out of sight, I refocused on the road ahead. Silence filled the car. We both processed the encounter in solitude, in our own minds, silent, driving under 10 kilometers per hour. I seldom recount this story, as many either scoff at it or attempt to rationalize it as a malnourished albino bear or things like that. Fast forward to a year later. Just before winter, his parents, who own a dog, came for a visit. One evening, at dusk, his mother and I were enjoying a smoke on our six-foot-high deck. It's positioned on the same side as the road leading to town, giving us a vantage point to the patch of woods where the prior encounter took place. Suddenly, the sound of snapping twigs resonated, coinciding with the dog's frantic barking. Despite his small stature, the dog appeared ready to leap off of the deck and chase something into the woods. He didn't, and the dog is fine. Just as my boyfriend emerged from the house, amidst the trees, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a tall, slender, white figure. Its definitive features were obscured, and given his mother's poor eyesight and her missing glasses, she didn't see much. But a gut-wrenching sensation told me that it was the same entity. I chose to share this experience, hoping for understanding and perhaps belief from those in this community. Now, we avoid venturing outside after dark. Strangely, a part of me yearns to see it again. Before this incident, I had read similar stories with a sense of detached fascination. But actually locking eyes with such an entity? The awe and terror were unparalleled. I often ponder this experience. It is so deeply etched into my memory that even the mere thought can evoke tears of fear. I hope someone else finds this story as compelling as I do. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. 
We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others, crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning, but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed, but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and fled in all direction into the trees. I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beast's bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth, and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed, or to go anywhere near those woods again.
I'll never forget the summer night my friends and I decided to explore the waterfall and creek on my family's rural property. We were bored teens looking for adventure. Little did we know what we would awaken. As dusk faded to darkness, we hiked along the creek, conjuring imaginary monsters in the shadows. Reaching the waterfall, we scrambled up the slippery rocks, laughter echoing. Behind the cascading water, a recess opened in the cliffside. Flashlight beams revealed a tunnel leading back into darkness. Grinning, we ducked inside, the roar of the falls fading behind us. The narrow cave passage spiraled deep into the earth, dripping water eroding strange patterns on the walls. It felt primal, pristine. Our voices bounced eerily down the unknown corridor. Finally, the tunnel opened into a high-ceilinged cavern with gigantic stalactites hanging like stone daggers. We craned our necks, awestruck. It was like entering a natural cathedral. Venturing farther, we stumbled upon something incredible, an underground lake, ink black and still as glass. Stalagmites ringed the shore like stone sentries. The place seemed off somehow, heavy with secrets best left undisturbed. Shivering despite the cavern's warmth, I turned to leave. The others begged to stay and explore, their voices too loud in the oppressive silence. Then, the still black lake began to ripple. At first, just faintly, then increasing until the entire surface roiled and churned violently, frothing white. My friend's laughter turned to screams. I shouted for everyone to run. We tore back through the twisting passageway as roaring filled the cavern, terrible and deafening. I chanced a backward glance and saw a pale, sinuous shape rising from the frothing water, malformed and gargantuan. We scrambled desperately up the slick tunnel, lungs burning, that monstrous roar pursuing us. Finally, we tumbled out behind the waterfall and sprinted down the wooded trail. At the farmhouse, we collapsed, gasping but too terrified to speak of what had awakened in that buried abyss. I only know we unleashed something primeval, lurking in those sunless depths since the dawn of time something that knows the surface world still waits above, full of light and life, not yet corrupted. The cave entrance now lies collapsed, sealed shut by a recent quake, according to geologists, but deep in my bones, I know the truth, that the tunnel collapse was no quake. It was the only way to re-entomb that which we should never have freed. I still have nightmares of the warped white form erupting from the subterranean lake, slamming into the cave walls in chaotic rage as it surged toward the surface, toward freedom. Whatever that ancient thing was, it thirsts to be unleashed, and I fear one day it may finish crawling out of the depths we disturbed, its patience eternal. It started as a hobby, rigging up old ham radio equipment in my attic to scan obscure frequencies on clear nights. Most often I'd only pick up static and garbled voices cutting in and out. But one cold February night, a new signal came through, crystal clear. A sequence of musical tones, almost like a synthesized choir chanting. It repeated every few minutes strong and purposeful. I recorded hours of it, transfixed. This was no random signal. It carried something meaningful, a clear message of some kind. I digitized the audio and ran it through decoding software to analyze the patterns. After days of work, a set of geographic coordinates emerged. 
To my shock, they pinpointed a remote spot less than 20 miles from my house. The signal had to be coming from there. The next morning, I hiked out to the coordinates located deep in the woods. I nearly dismissed it as just a prank when the alleged source came into view. A small ramshackle cabin stood tucked away off the trail. Was someone just broadcasting weird signals from their backwoods home? Curiosity propelled me forward, but nearing the cabin, things seemed off. Strange dish antennas, rolls of wire and other electronics cluttered the perimeter instead of firewood or tools. The windows emitted a faint blue glow. Apprehension swelled within me, but I had to see who or what was in there. I crept onto the porch and peered inside. Complex machines and panels covered every surface, flashing and beeping as abstract images raced across monitors. And working intently at a console was something I could barely comprehend. A tall, spindly being with huge, opaque eyes and pale blue skin. It took me a moment to accept that it was real and not human. I must have made a gasp because the creature's head jerked up to look right at me. I was too shocked to even panic as it moved swiftly to the door. It opened it halfway, studying me cautiously with those impenetrable black eyes. You should not be here, it finally said in a strangely resonant voice. But if you have decoded my broadcast, perhaps you can understand my situation. Please come in. Part of me wanted to bolt from this bizarre situation, but my curiosity won out. I slowly entered what I now realized was a spaceship in the guise of a cabin. The alien sat me down and offered fluid in a curious metal vessel. As I sipped the sweet libation, it began its tale. Its name was unpronounceable in my tongue, so I just called it Zarin. Many cycles ago, Zarin served as researcher on an exploratory vessel. Its crew had strict orders to covertly observe developing worlds without contact. But one day they encountered a grievous distress signal from Earth. Against protocols, they intercepted a primitive capsule hurtling through space. Inside were two distressed Earth creatures. While the creatures were safely returned, the unauthorized rescue led to disaster. Accused of dangerous cultural contamination, Zarin was exiled on this very planet, its actions sought to aid. Its crew abandoned it here over a century ago by Earth time. Zarin had been surviving in hiding, ceaselessly monitoring human airwaves to understand its caretaker's mysterious culture. My mind reeled taking all this in. Of all the backyard hobbyists to pick up its covert signal, Zarin was intrigued that I alone seemed drawn to make contact. It confessed that it had slowly been going mad from isolation and longed to make amends by using its knowledge to aid humanity. But first, it required help adapting to society. I knew then why that strange broadcast had called me so powerfully. A higher purpose had drawn me straight to this extraordinary refugee. Doing so came with great risk. Even interacting this far could be seen as treason by its people. But how could I turn away? After swearing to secrecy, I helped Zarin slowly integrate into the world. It learned English, adopted a human disguise, and made breakthroughs in science using its advanced knowledge while living anonymously among us. My relationship to this alien will forever remain hidden, but I know humanity has gained immeasurably from Zarin's presence, even if they remain oblivious. And this remarkable being can finally share its culture's wisdom after lifetimes of silence. The radio hobby that connected us across light years of separation was no accident. I was meant to help this alien in exile find a belonging in its newfound home. Within its tale, I see hope that our differences need not divide us, that the greatest rewards come from opening our minds to possibility. Zarin gave me the universe by showing me how to more fully inhabit this single fleeting life for however long our unlikely friendship can preserve.
Beacon Hill, with its gaslit streets and federal-style row houses, always felt to me like a step back in time. The quaint neighborhood, rich in history and allure, was a daily reminder of Boston's storied past. My family's home, passed down through generations, sat nestled in its heart. One summer, while renovating the basement, we unearthed a hidden passage leading to a small, sealed chamber. Inside, we found remnants of what seemed like an old tavern, wooden stools, dusty bottles, and an old ledger filled with names, many dating back to the revolutionary era. Soon after the discovery, strange occurrences began. Every night, muffled voices echoed from the basement, the clinking of glasses, laughter, and debates, all culminating into the tune of a fiddle. It was as though the tavern had sprung back to life, playing host to its long-departed patrons. Curiosity overcoming fear, I decided to spend a night in the chamber. As midnight approached, the atmosphere shifted. The room, though void of any living soul but myself, felt crowded. Shadows flitted across the walls, and soon the murmurs began. I could discern snippets of conversations, tales of battle, secret meetings, revolutionary plans, and stories of love and loss. Among these voices, one stood out, a young woman's voice singing a mournful ballad of a lover lost at sea. As dawn neared, the spectral gathering waned, and the chamber plunged back into silence. I emerged from the basement feeling a deep connection with the spirits that once called Boston their home. Digging deeper into the house's history, I learned that it stood atop an old tavern, a hot spot for revolutionaries, thinkers, and sailors in the 18th century. The singer, as per local legends, was Lillian, the tavern owner's daughter, who often sang for patrons and tragically lost her fiancé to the tempestuous Atlantic. Today, our basement remains a testament to Beacon Hill's vibrant past. While we've modernized it, the old chamber is preserved, and on some nights, when the winds howl and the city sleeps, you can still hear the echoes of a time gone by, the whispers beneath the cobblestones, reminding us of the souls that once walked these streets and the stories they left behind. A few years back, I was staying in Hot Springs for a small project. The town, steeped in history and known for its actual hot springs, also had an undercurrent of stories about paranormal happenings, something I've always been curious about but never truly believed. That skepticism was challenged severely during my stay. It began on my second night in town. At precisely midnight, I was startled from my work by haunting music that seemed to seep through the very walls of my accommodation. It was a melody that sounded distant, yet unmistakably clear, the kind that sent shivers down your spine, melancholic and otherworldly. Curiosity peaked, I ventured outside, following the music through the desolate streets. The town, lively and bustling by day, felt like an entirely different world under the moon's pale glow with the eerie tune as its soundtrack. It seemed like I was being lured down a path that I couldn't resist, each note pulling me further into the town's depths. The source of the music became clear when I reached a part of the old town known for its once thriving jazz scene, now just a collection of dilapidated buildings. In the moonlight, a decrepit jazz club, abandoned for decades, seemed to pulse with the song. The melody was clearer now, full of sorrow, and it flowed through the broken windows and crumbling doorways. 
Compelled to find the musician, I entered the club. The music guided me to the main hall, where an astonishing scene unfolded before my eyes. On the stage, a ghostly figure swayed, an ethereal saxophone at his lips. The specter was surrounded by empty chairs and tables that testified to the club's bygone days of jubilance. But something darker caught my eye. Beneath the stage, almost obscured by the shadows, I noticed a subtle shift in the darkness, a chained door, slightly ajar, that exuded an aura of malevolence that the ghostly musician's melancholy could not mask. I approached, inexplicably drawn to whatever secrets lay behind it. Inside, I found remnants of what looked like rituals, strange symbols etched into the ground, burnt out candles, and, most disturbingly, small bones scattered across the dirt floor. The air was thick with the stench of decay, and an overwhelming sense of dread took hold. The music, once entrancing, now seemed like a mournful warning. It dawned on me that the ghostly figure was not just a remnant of the past, but a sentinel, highlighting the sinister undertones that lurked beneath the town's history. I stumbled back from the hidden room, the musician's sorrowful melody following as I fled the club. I reported my findings to the local authorities as an anonymous tip, not mentioning the ghostly aspects, of course. It led to an investigation where they unearthed a series of historical, unsolved disappearances linked to occult practices within the town. The music, though, remains a mystery. The townsfolk accepted it as a quirk of their history-rich home. To this day, I remember the haunting melody that first drew me into the streets, a spectral musician's lament that unveiled a hidden darkness, ensuring it would not go unnoticed, demanding it not be forgotten. The city was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and sprawling plazas, soaked in a history that I could only appreciate through the lens of a camera. Every corner seemed steeped in a story that I couldn't fully grasp. I didn't speak the language, relying on fractured phrases and Google Translate to get by. Restaurants, museums, shopping, simple transactions, aided by the ubiquity of the universal language of currency but a deeper understanding of the place and its people eluded me. Then came that first night. Jet-lagged and restless, I wandered into the old district, away from the well-trodden paths of fellow tourists. Midnight approached. The chimes of a distant clock tower marked the hour, a dozen resonant dings echoing in the stillness. I stumbled upon a hole-in-the-wall bar sparsely populated by locals. The moment I stepped inside, something shifted. The bartender spoke, and instead of hearing unintelligible sounds, I understood him perfectly. What will you have? he asked. I answered fluently, ordering a drink in a language I didn't know I spoke. The transformation was jarring. I felt like I'd been granted access to a secret layer of the world, one that had always been there right beyond the veil of comprehension. Conversations around me became transparent, people discussing politics, love, and the trials of everyday life. Words flowed from my mouth effortlessly, my tongue deftly navigating the syntax and grammar as if I had spoken the language all my life. My newfound ability persisted. I left the bar, wandered through the labyrinthine streets, and found myself among late-night vendors and night owls. I conversed with ease, each interaction deepening my connection to the city and its inhabitants. But I also felt like an imposter, trespassing in a realm that wasn't meant for me. As the sky started to brighten, a sense of dread settled in. Would my newfound ability disappear as mysteriously as it had arrived? A clock somewhere struck four, and just like that, the words became muffled, opaque. My midnight fluency had evaporated, 
leaving me with nothing but an aftertaste of what had been. I returned to my hotel room, a profound sense of loss mingling with wonder. For the rest of my trip, every night at the stroke of midnight, I found myself immersed in this alternate reality, a fluent stranger in a land that felt increasingly like home. And each morning the spell broke, pushing me back into the sphere of the outsider. I spoke to no one about it. Who would believe me? Who could make sense of this bizarre circadian talent? I took no videos, snapped no audio clips. It felt wrong to document what I couldn't explain. On my last night, I stayed in. I watched the city through my window, the streets slowly emptying, the sounds of a language I could temporarily call my own, filling the air as the clock tower struck midnight. A final evening of fluency before boarding a plane to a place where words wouldn't evade me. I left the city, carrying its alleys and midnight conversations in the inner chambers of my memory, an experience bound to time and place. I still travel, exploring other foreign lands and other tongues, but every time the clock strikes midnight, wherever I am, I'm taken back to those winding streets, to that hole-in-the-wall bar, to the people I spoke with in a language that only truly became mine in the shadowy realm between one day and the next.